Everybody and welcome to the very first episode of Quest as we journey into the true crime and paranormal. And I'm so excited about this. This has been like a lifelong uh, dream of mine. I'm really into the true crime and paranormal. And I'm like, what better way, you know, I have my other talk show, you know, for us to come together and talk about subjects that are really interesting. And there's, I mean, there's such a huge interest about the paranormal and true crime. So I'm like, what if we just brought them both together and intermixed and have guests who know about the topics and just, you know, just talk about it. I'm really asking you something too, Sam. Um, you know, you're also a, a clairvoyant. And um, do you believe, I, like me personally, but I wanted to see what you thought. I, I don't believe in coincidences. Yeah. Do you? When you brought up numerology, I, I find it really fascinating. So, for example, so 1892, when uh, the Borden murders happened, it's the 200 years, 200 years prior, there were the Salem witch trials. Uh, so that was oh, in 1692. 16, you are correct. Yeah. Wow. So, so that I find that interesting. I also find that so another, another I wanted to throw out this as well. So there was Bertha Manchester. Uh, so I've connected with with Lizzie so while filming Curse of Lizzie Borden, but also mm -hmm. her spirit. And she kept saying Bertha Manchester. I'm like, what's who's Bertha Manchester? Well, actually, while four days before Lizzie Borden's trial, uh, there was another axe murder that happened in Fall River uh, near the the Borden house uh, on Second Street. And Bertha Manchester was killed in a very similar fashion with a hatchet as well. Hmm. So, uh, so the, the the thing is, you know, I I feel, you know, the person supposedly was caught. His name was uh, Jose uh, Demello. Uh, however, I, I I don't feel like he did it as well. So, as a clairvoyant, I feel like that there may be something. I don't not to get into conspiracy theories, but my theory with Curtis Lizzie Borden is that Lizzie physically did it but she was taken over by something darker like i i say possibly a family curse but sort of like an energy that compelled her to do it like she wasn't in her right mind she doesn't take responsibility for the murders well let me ask you this and back up on something that you that you just said second street now is that the address of lizzie's house or the jose what which address is that Oh, so that's that's in Fall River. So that's the murder house. Uh, it, that's the location where the the murders took place in 1892. Okay, now you ready for this? Second what, Street is, is also the address for Velisca X Murder House oh. and the Sally House. Second, uh, the the uh, Second Street. Hmm. Really? Yes. Okay, that's fascinating. Three, yeah, like I three of the uh, yeah. 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 I mean, Sally House wasn't, um, you know, like an axe related thing, but they have five. Oh, actually, Sally House and Villisca have the same uh, 508 Second Street, the same uh, the address. But now that you're saying that in Fall River, that that one is also a Second Street. Do you know the, I'm sure you know the numericals on that or? Yeah, I don't know that actually at the top of my head, I don't, but, Do you mind um, and it also up? too, like what, what it was when it was recorded in 1892 it's mm -hmm. different the, the the street numbers changed so sure. i'll i'll get back to you on that but okay. i do feel uh, i do feel i i do feel like there's some odd co like connections whether or not it's just serendipity uh and it's like coincidental that it's happening but like even the dates and just sort of the the way that the the murders took place i mean that the amount the ferocity of the board murders uh the fact that it was you know abby Abby, uh, you know, whacked. I mean, the the, the story is that Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her father forty wax. It was not as not forty wax, but it was, you know, it was close to forty wax. So the savagery, the crime of passion involves, to me, implies that possibly Lizzie Borden, you know, it, like there's other things going on if she was in her right mind or she wasn't in her right mind when it when it took place. Right, and I just you know I just actually honestly got chills that there's three places with the same street address. Mm. But why do they always... Yeah. Is it because it's just kind of stretched our human mind that we can't comprehend? Sam, what do you think about that? Like, we can't really comprehend how someone can do something like this. And we don't want to admit as a society that there's someone amongst us that is that evil. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, I mean, even the the heinous connecting with the spirits of Andrew Borden and 
Abby Borden. I, I, you know, Abby, Abby was not a wicked stepmother. She, like, she was a real person. So I, I, I get emotional every time I go back to the murder house in Fall River. I get emotional for them, but I also get emotional for Lizzie as well because I feel that she's kind of given, you know, because she's a woman, uh, she was ostracized, lived a pretty miserable life, even though she was acquitted. Uh, pop culture, you know, turned her into the ultimate, you know, villainous, mm -hmm. and so I feel. I feel like that that um, that w there, there's a lot of scapegoating going on, <clears throat> and I feel that uh, that the innate evil is out there, whether or not it's paranormal or supernatural, or if it's actual people uh, committing these heinous crimes, whether it's racially motivated or it's uh, socioeconomic motivated, which is the case with Andrew. He had a lot of enemies as well, so there are people that could have targeted him specifically, and and possibly my distant cousin Lizzie Borden could be innocent and she what wants me to bridget? prove her innocence what about bridget I yeah mean, bridget bridget's been considered too and and that's the thing i bridget was there and so was lizzie so bridget uh was said she was asleep upstairs while the murders took place uh having investigated that house multiple times that seems kind of far-fetched to me like that, that like that like is really like you slept through two heinous uh murders that happened in the house two like one floor below in the case of Abby and two floors below in the case of Andrew. Uh, so Bridget, I, I, so I feel that Bridget and Lizzie potentially, they could have had, you know, the, the rumor or the, the legend is that they were, um, that they had an affair, uh, that there was sexual abuse, which I strongly, and I'm in the school that possibly there was sexual abuse perpetuated towards Bridget uh, and also towards uh, Lizzie, Lizzie Borden as well. And pro probably Emma too. On the, from Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not proven. It's not fact. But the facts are that um, you know, I, I feel I feel that uh, if you really know Lizzie or Lizbeth, as she likes to be called, she she didn't have it in her. She also and something that came up in my research for my book. Uh, she was a, a Sunday school teacher, and a couple of weeks before the actual uh, the murders, actually it was a month before, she had her hands crushed by a dumbwaiter at the that the church oh, hmm. uh and this was in the this the the church's newsletter um miss lizzie borden a daughter of andrew borden uh was was injured at church from a dumbwaiter and she although she didn't have her hands broken the fact that she was injured before the murders to me it, it, it's suspect that she couldn't physically do it. and she was a small framed woman so mm -hmm. the fact that she was accused and, and acquitted i actually part of me feels like that there's no i, I, I always say it's not i'm 99 sure that she actually did it but i'm 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 not now I, i'm kind of going back maybe something else is at play yeah because i mean you actually have channeled her right i well i channeled eliza borden who was another another uh perpetrator right. uh, who killed her children and that so on the show i channeled eliza i when i Lizzie, I I don't channel Lizzie. I kind of keep okay. her away from you. I'm a little, she's a little sassy. But I know, noticed that you talk to her, you talk about her like in the present tense. Yeah, like she's my friend. Right, I mean, right, I've right. actually, I picked her out. Like when I not only have I communicated with her, but I've also uh, I've gotten EVPs uh, during the filming of Curse Lizzie Borden. Uh, the question that my producers wanted me at, to ask was, Lizzie, did you kill your father and stepmother? And I say it, and on the recording, you can hear uh, her crying in agony, like, oh, stop asking me that question. Stop asking me. I didn't do it. I didn't. You can hear her screaming in agony, like, stop asking me that question. So not only was she uh, tormented in during, after the murders, but she was tormented in the afterlife as well. Yeah. Oh, because was it, I'm trying to remember, It was it on your show when, but I'm a good, but I'm a good daughter? Yeah, like she wants, she wants people like me to prove her innocence so she can cross. So they, they, I don't, I feel on a spiritual level, she keeps getting called back, whether it's to the murder house and through investigations or her, where she loves, which is her later in life home called Maple Crop, right. where I feel like that, that she actually resides. If you, if you want to find a location where Elizabeth is, is, but I feel like that there was a split of some sort. There's a crazy Lizzie, as I call it, um, that could have splintered and sort of psychically imprinted itself on the, on the, in the murder house uh, that is crazy. And then there's sort of a, the, the woman that I know, my distant cousin, Elizabeth, who um, her spirit resides with her puppies, by the way, uh, in Maplecroft. So I do feel, so 
I, I really thought for sure that that Lizzie did it. I really was convinced. But I, I've even looked into trains and the possibility that there's a tie to Velasca uh, into the axemen of Louisiana mm -hmm. uh, as well. I, I feel that there's odd similarities. The, there, there was a train depot in Fall River very, very close to the home. And <laughs> I know it was in 1892 and the murders happened in the early 1900s, but I... I I still, my gut tells me there's something going on here. I really Another thing to point out too. So one of our other cousins who was murdered, uh, Sarah Maria Cornell, uh, she was murdered by a, a minister as well. His name Ephraim, Ephraim Avery. Uh, also right outside of Fall River, and that happened. Uh, that happened after. Uh, actually, no, what happened before the murders in 1892. So I, I do see, a, I do see a, something going on here. There's like a religious. Uh, and you also have the people that were accused also were either challenged the status quo mm -hmm. or they, uh, so like Sarah Marie Cornell, she was a mill worker, came from a prominent family. She probably got pregnant by the minister. Uh, and so that's why he was suspected of killing her. But he was acquitted like Lizzie Borden the, uh, from Avery. So, yeah, so she was heavily involved in the church and, and very pious and religious, actually. So actually, I'm, I'm thinking we have my little show here, but between us, uh, you know, for talking, I mean, we have really just came across some things that maybe hasn't been thought of before. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, first question that I'm sure that you're asked many times is, when did you know, like when you were younger or that you had the gift um, for seeing dead people as a kid, when you see this little kid running around your house that you keep playing with, that you don't put two and two together because he's always in the room before you get there and, oh, just an imaginary friend. And then you see another person in your room and you see another person and it's like, tell your mom and she's like, you're not special. You're just Cajun. <laughs> and I was like, thanks. Right. That's a, for therapy later. Right. And then when I was in school, I growing up and being bullied like I was, I had these very emotional moments and I would know things about my bullies because they were like close proximity in my space. And then later, years later, I would contact them and be like, hey, so look, I, you know, I forgive you for what you did. I also knew that your dad did X, Y, and Z. And I also know that your mom abused you. And they're like, how would you know that? I never told anybody. And you're like, oh, crap. Right. <laughs> and you realize that these things are real. These things are happening. And you put two and two together and you do a little research and you realize that you're picking this stuff up. And then you look back and realize, that's why my mom was saying that she always felt odd in the house and she knew this and grandma always said X, Y, and Z. I think everyone can do this, but I think the people who put a lot of effort into mastering it do it like me, which is a daily basis. Now, let me ask you something. Was this uh, like the gift handed down from generations in your family or were you the first one who had it or, or how did it happen? So again, I'm just not special. I'm just Cajun. Right. So uh, my mom... You could at least brought Boudin. I don't <laughs> right. know. Right. Uh, we're not in Laugh yet. That's oh, the only right. place well, we could go Boudin. You could have no. um, So yeah, my mom and my grandma talked about things like this happening a lot when they were growing up. So my mom said in her house, you'd see, you know, things move across the house or things move or you'd feel like a hand touch you, you know, in the dark. And they just chalked it up to being loved ones. And this was just something that was totally understood. Growing up in Cajun, you know, background, my mom's grandfather was a traite. And so it was no big deal to have a guy come over who only spoke French and was like, we're going to do prayers and we're going to do this and this and do healing work. So the paranormal and spiritual was always very present growing up. And the fact that our dead are buried six feet in front of our faces. It was super normal to be discussed, but it wasn't kind of a, oh, you can do this. It was a, oh, it's no big deal. And then when you start doing it on purpose in a teenage year, because you're like, I need to investigate how, like, what's, what's going on. That's when it got odd. You know, everyone was like, oh, no, this is just normal. And then it's like, oh, so you're doing a thing. Oh, that's cool. And then you just kept going. And I don't think it was necessarily handed down, but I do think it was... Because it was so common, it made it more comfortable to learn in my family. Well, let me ask you this. Like, is there any uh, spirit or like a spirit guide or, or anything that has came with you, grown with you through the years? Has, has when you were a child that's like kind of stayed with you all these years? Or do you, do you have like a special ancestor that you may rely on or spirit guide or anything like that that when you're contacting uh, those that are crossed now it's always my mom mm -hmm. um because my mother passed in 2014 from cancer and so now i 
I see and deal with her all the time. But growing up, my dad's mom had passed when I was a very small child. I remember seeing her a lot and feeling her a lot. Um, I There's a plethora of dead people in spirit. <laughs> I mean, sure. a lot of dead people. And I've noticed that depending on what I'm dealing with, where I'm at in my life, what issues I get into, I have a little bit of a different voice every time. So I am very open to whomever wants to help because God knows I need it. Uh, especially when tax season rolls around. And <laughs> Don't I, we all? I talk to dead people, not numbers. And so it's very helpful, but it's it's a lot more common than people think. Anytime you are thinking about a loved one and out of nowhere and all of a sudden someone brings up their name, that's them being like, oh yeah, this is why you're thinking about me. So I don't think there's any necessarily one person. I think it's you know your whole crew. I absolutely think it is egotistical to think that we are alone in this universe. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, but with people disappearances, it's I've had family members contact me um, and get sessions to see about like missing loved ones, and it's not very often. And I think it's more so that they're afraid to figure out like to get a solid answer. But I've had it where I'm like, look. This person feels alive to me, but because they still feel very intentional, they still have these intentions of living, and this I wanted these changes. And I do feel like a lot of people do have more, I need to up and leave my life. We face with mediumship yeah. and, and psychism when it comes to reading someone who has gone missing, because we face this moral conundrum. You have a loved one who's in front of you who's missing this, this person. You also have to take into account, did the person who leave, leave intentionally? If they are missing, quote unquote, but they left because they were living in a very abusive life, yeah, they can't let anyone know. So I do think people do tend to abscond their life a lot more than we realize they do. Um, I did that when I left my hometown and moved here. It was literally kind of like an overnight decision. People didn't know where I was going because I wasn't in the kind of danger but I think we need to realize that there's a lot more abuse going on in the world than we realize. But I do believe that people, I don't know if I believe necessarily spiritually, but I do believe there are odd things in this world where people go missing for no reason. Um, I do believe in aliens, but not necessarily, I don't know if it's the way everybody else does. But I do believe that there's always some sort of um, spiritual understanding that they're either okay or that they passed. We, as an we are animals. And animals have this thing that if they're not in a safe place, they'll sort of leave their mm -hmm. uh, group to get away from the, the masses to not get them sick. So like the fight or flight kind of? Yeah. And so like if, like, if an animal's dying, it's going to leave their home yeah. to not get the rest of the, the group sick. Right. And I think we as people do the same thing, but we've rationalized that it's, oh, they're having anxiety or they're having this. I think that's happening a lot more. And because a lot of times when I've had that happen with, I didn't hear from someone for a couple months, they're like oh, I was grieving and I just need to get away from my life. Mm -hmm. People don't think about that because they tend to be very I-focused, not uh, us-focused. And so I haven't, I haven't really seen a lot of experiences where the person leaving, it's either they passed, like some horrible thing happened where they were on a trip and then they died and no one knew. Yeah. Or it's, they probably started a new life, <laughs> to be honest. That's what I believe. You are doing readings and, and all things um, psychic mediumships yeah. uh, full-time now. Yes, I work from home. All of my, my sessions are done either by Zoom or phone call. Um, I like people to feel comfortable in their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, I like when people who have situations like this come to me. Um, I do my best to try to make a living doing this with people who are just interested for the fun of it. So that way I have time to work with those who are really, really grieving to help people heal. I try to do public demonstrations where it might be like a $20 ticket and there might be a room full of people who can just watch me get work and maybe get a reading or just kind of see how this works. And I try to make it as accessible as possible because I do know there are people out there who are genuinely in need of the healing work that mediumship is. Right. And I try to leave the psychic work to people who are trying to find direction in their life but are also just like looking for a bit of a parlor trick, so to speak. They like the fun of it. Like, like they like getting read for filth the way Auntie Sean does. <laughs> And telling them about the their self reader. Yes, I will be like, "Oh, honey, you are the drama," and so <laughs> they love that because it's fun and also. I mean, it's always meant to be helpful and healing, but I try to make the mediumship where it's like you're dealing with grief. Let's focus on that, because her family um, was Maggie or Margie. Oh, Margie. I'm terrible with names. I can literally Margie. look at your name and never remember it five seconds later. Um, her family are still grieving. They are, you know, and so. Yeah. 
when I have someone who lost someone 20 years ago or 20 days ago or 20 minutes ago, you know, there's this sense of like, let's help you understand that this is here. Let's help you understand that these people are okay. You know, Margie's in spirit. She's fine. She's, she's well, and she's not angry because she doesn't have bills to pay and she's healthy and there's nothing to worry about. There's no stress there. She's concerned about her loved ones getting that same healing mm -hmm. and while they're still alive. So she's up there trying to con um, console them and be there for them. And, but it's here to help people realize that you need to work, work on you, focus on you. If you need to see her killer brought to justice, that's your, that's what you need to do. And that's fine. But she wants you to be okay. And so I, I wish, you know, I wish there were, you know, the world we didn't live in where I could be like, yeah, okay, this is what I get about Miss Margie, yeah. yada, yada, yada. But there is that sense of like, does this person's family believe in this? Right. You know, do I, do I offend them in the effort to help them? But who am I to impro impose that upon them? And so it's just one of those things where, you know, reach out to people, ask, you know, I'm the kind of person who, if you respect my work, then I will respect you. If you come to me with attitude or being cruel and making fun of it, then I'll be like, look, I'm not going to talk to you. Right. But I've had people be like, look, I really can't afford this. Can we have a short conversation? I've had people be like, look, I will cook you dinner. I don't have money, but I will Ooh. cook you dinner. And I'd be like, hold up. Hey. My, oh, are we going to have to cut? Yeah. Sure. Okay. My fat ass will totally let you cook me dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I bring my boyfriend along? Because he likes to eat too. <laughs> and right. so like, but I, you know, helping people who are genuinely in a bad spot who don't have the money. That's what I work hard for on a daily basis for the people who have the money to buy readings. So I can afford to take care of people who don't. And, you know, it's it's a world we live in where the only thing that really can help with a lot of the stress is hope. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to peddle. It's the realization of that regardless of how you find hope, you know, that's all that matters. I've had to disclaimer with my clients quite often, you're gonna hear from who you need to, not who you want to. And then we yes. can get into the want to. I actually <clears throat> have a question about that. I don't have a gift, right? And that's we fine. all do. You just haven't found, maybe I haven't connected to it yet. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. But I do have a question. Whenever you are talking to somebody or helping somebody, both of you, do you ever have an instance where it's more than one spirit trying to get through or trying to talk? Yes. And how does that feel? What is that like? So it's like being, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like being in, uh, it's like being at work when all of your coworkers and your boss are like, I need this, I need that, I need this, and that. And at one point you're just like, shut up. <laughs> so, um, especially when I do galleries. So yeah. galleries are when we do platform membership in front of in front of a group of people. That's when the that's when the question came up when you there mentioned will be that you do that. Ten people in line, or like just I will see them spattered around the audience, and I'm like, and as soon as I start noticing them, I start getting this like the Oh, I feel a heart attack here. Oh, I feel a stroke. Oh, I feel like cancer. Oh, I feel this new um, old age, <clears throat> whatever it is. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, excuse me. Can y'all stop? <laughs> Can y'all get in line? Like file, single file, you right. know? Um, just because y'all are dead doesn't mean y'all are animals. Let's go. And so um, it does happen. And then I have had where I'll read it, reading for one person in the room, one-on-one, -on -one, and they've had so many people who've passed. And it's just like a cacophony yeah. of people in my head. And I have to be like, okay, who who represents the family? And because I'm gay, because I'm Auntie Sean, it's always going to be a grandmother or a mom or an auntie. <laughs> Grandma comes in and she's like, that'd be me. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, ma'am, it would. <laughs> right. Um, and so we do get them, we do have to work with them because they're conscious, they're intelligent just like we are. Yeah. And I hate you, we need to do this. I know that y'all know that my potential of doing this is way bigger than I probably realize it is, but I am human and I am tired. So there is that. Um, but most of the time it'll usually start off as a trickle, mm -hmm. one person. And then once you get rolling into it, it's much more comfortable to deal with, oh, so grandma's talking about so-and-so and so-and-so's -and -so here and, and it be, just becomes kind of more organized. Yeah. Yeah. But man, when you just have that one person who comes in and they're just really emotional because they've lost a lot of people yeah. and just like five people show up and you're just like, shut up, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Who's first? Who's first? <laughs> yeah. Although, you know, I've never ever had one person walk up to me and say, I don't really believe in ghosts. If yeah. they did, I would say, that's great, <laughs> but that doesn't stop them from believing in you. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to have some close encounters of the spooky kind, um, but also uh, the enlightening kind, go take a tour of the farmhouse and feel the energy. 
at that farmhouse. Go to Harrisville, Rhode Island, to what is known as the Conjuring House, and take a tour of a place that will change the way you think and feel about everything. You know, people that spend the night there and do investigations come out with their minds blown. They, you know, inevitably has have something happen to them that they are certain was uh, from another realm, not in their natural 3D world in that house, because that's not where that house is. It's somewhere between the third, fourth, fifth dimension and beyond. It's a vortex. It's a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. Even when you were younger, that you knew that you were going to write a book about the story of the Harrisville house. Yeah. That you. It really is that. It's the Richardson Arnold Homestead. Mm hmm. Um, uh, but, you know, to the rest of the world, it's the Conjuring House, the real place sure. that it was based on. So, yeah, it's uh, it's got, you know, we didn't know of its reputation when we moved in. There were people that knew there was activity there, but it was not something, you know, I don't know how, how old you are, Misty, but. I just turned 65, so I'm officially old. I'm Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare old. See, I don't even know what I have yet. <laughs> um, and um, I remember a time when it was considered very, very taboo to mm -hmm. even talk about this. I was threatened with expulsion. You know, I was a, a really good student who followed all the rules, you know, a goody two shoes. But when people asked me about the house, I spoke openly and honestly about it. And it almost got me expelled from high school. Wow. So I don't, I do not, um, uh, as a rule, uh, talk about it in a, a large public setting or where there might be somebody that takes umbrage with who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to be aware of that, cognizant of that now. But I really think that most of my trepidation about it comes from, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago when uh, it was a very different situation than it is now. People have come to accept that there's something beyond our mortal existence. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes what I talk about can fracture a belief system in mm -hmm. another and they have to reject it because they're, you know, for instance, there are religions where you are not allowed to believe in ghosts, Correct. period. Correct. Or not. And that's, uh, it's in the bylaws for God's sake. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to be mindful and respectful of the feelings of other people, Misty. It's uh, important that people have their belief systems. Even atheists have a belief system and their belief is that there's no such thing as God. Right. So let me ask you something because you were talking about, you know, how respectful that you are about other people's beliefs and would you consider yourself like a sensitive or an empath or anything? I don't uh, label myself anything at all. Okay. Because I think I'm everything all at once. And, and then some, you know, I read light language from extraterrestrials. Most people can't say that. Mm -hmm. um, I have experiences that have been so life altering for me and mind blowing for those that I have shared it with that it's, if I hadn't grown up the way that I did, living the experiences that I did with my family. And I read our story just as a, a book. I don't know if I would be able to believe some of what is in there. I think that everything that we do in life, whatever we put out in some way, shape or form, it, based on the circular nature of life and, and of our entire universe, even the, the shape of the planets to the ring we put on our fingers when we marry the person we love. Mm -hmm. It's universal. 
And it seems to me that the most important thing about this story is it's not a horror story. The Conjuring is considered a horror movie, mm -hmm. but our story, the real true story, yes, there are things in there that are horrifying. People have said, I can't read your books and sleep at night. I can't read your books at night. I have to sleep with the lights on after I read, you know, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to write it that way. That was not my intention to scare the hell out of you. You know, because ultimately it's it's really a love story. It's a story of forgiveness and redemption, yeah. of acknowledgement and gratitude and the embracing of those that dwelled among us. You know, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we lived with the dead for a decade. Wow. And even the cranky ones, um, <laughs> I just love, <laughs> I do, because they exist, yeah. you know, I mean, who knows what kind of lives they led that, you know, that made them as cranky as they are. I think all they need is love. I think all any of us need is love. And love is our superpower and it is the ultimate healing force in life. I really, I do believe in the power of love. I do. Um, I've been working very closely with a very gifted couple, uh, Cody Despian and Satori Hawes. Oh, uh, yes. And they have developed a method of communicating directly with spirit oh. that is um, something I never thought that I would live to see, but I have. And I do everything in my power to support them and lift them up and get their message out into the world because the last time I was at the farm, uh, the spirits got very, very active, got like their feathers ruffled and they were trying to come through Satori and she's like, whoa, whoa, I can't talk to all of you at once <laughs> simultaneously. You know, who's got a message? Who's the message for? They spell out Andrea. And then they have this method of going through the alphabet and, right. and the tapping stops on yes or no. Uh, one for yes, two for no, and then a, a knock, an ethereal knock. You cannot determine where the sound is coming from um, when it happens. And so, oh my God, I'm sitting on the sofa just watching them in front of the fireplace. And the message is for me, Satori says, how many words? There's four taps, four words. And then they spell out we miss your family. Oh, I was blown that away. That was everything. I was sitting on that sofa just crying like a little girl. Just yeah. so touched. Wow. Such love that I feel for them. As though I know them as well as my own family. That there is a familial attachment and I saw an apparition in the house when I was 17 years old. I only saw her once. And she was the spitting image of me at this age with bigger hair and a bun on the top of her head, but the same basic hair, thick, gray, with a very beautiful dress on with a high collar that went all the way to the floor. We were standing on the hearthstone and I looked into her eyes and they were my eyes. I looked at her facial structure and it was mine as an older woman. And I was 17 years old, just about to turn 18. And she smiled at me. She smiled at me. It was, it just, it, it touched me to the core of my being. And I realized everybody in the family could see her. They were all sitting at the dining room table looking in because my father saw her first. He saw her before I saw her. And I turned and I looked and there she was, but she was facing me sideways. And so nobody else could see her face except me. And she was a mirror image reflection of me at this age. Wow. So I feel 
an attachment. You know, mom said, we could leave the farm, but the farm will never leave us. Well, and she's, she's right. she was right about that. My mother's right about everything. It's just a given. If she says it, she's right. Right. And um, and it and it didn't. And it has continued with uh, all of us have been touched by spirit, spirit throughout the course of our lives since living at the farm, because you know well, Misty, once that door is open, you can never close it again. Yeah, and it's it's strange too, because in a lot of respects, I feel like this is my first and only time on this planet. I really do, I mm -hmm. mean that. And so it's it's counterintuitive, it's contradictory for me to have a vision of an apparition when I really feel that this is my first and only time that I am assigned here, that I am out of here. I have always felt like a misfit. I have always had to fake it till I make it. Uh, everything about my life and my perception of reality is so skewed compared to most everyone else that I know. Uh, that I, it's, it's almost, um, I feel like some clerical error was made in the cosmos. Like I, I got sent to the wrong place at the wrong time. And what the people around me say is, no, 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 you got sent to the right place at the right time. And your message is so powerful and so important. And I say, well, but I'm only the messenger. It could be anybody. And then they say, no, it had to be you. You right. had to experience what you did. It was your destiny. And then live that experience. And then 30 years later, tell the world the true story. And then it burgeoned into a feature film that went all around the world and, you know, virtually every language and, and, I got catapulted from relative obscurity mm -hmm. where my books would be languishing had it not been for The Conjuring to, you know, the one of the top uh, booksellers in this genre in the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I delve far more deeply into the good versus evil uh, aspects of our story in the books mm -hmm. and many people write to me and tell me after they've completed the trilogy that they feel like they lived at the farm with us that they experienced those things with us that it became part of their lives that it got into their minds and into their bloodstreams and 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 it's often been described as interactive literature you have to know when to put the book down when it gets really intense, whichever volume you happen to be in. Um, and at some point I will republish them because so much has happened at the farm since we left. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it warrants, uh, you know, there's, it's a never ending story. And with now Cody and Satori being there and doing what they do uh, it is it has been one revelation after another I'll give you a specific case in point um, I wasn't there that night but uh, Ken DaCosta from Rise Up Paranormal mm -hmm. was there they were filming and uh, Julie DeMay from Rise Up was there and covering one camera Ken had another and uh what happened with Cody and Satori that night was amazing. Uh, when we moved, the day that we moved into the house, uh, four of the five of us, uh, the children, saw an apparition standing in the corner of the dining room, fixated on Mr. Kenyon, who's the man we bought the house from, and he was moving out as we were moving in. It was January 11th, 1971. And, um, Coincidentally, my, and I don't believe in coincidence, uh, the birthday of my friend George. Oh, okay. um, he, that's the day he turned eight years old. <laughs> and um, I saw him first, but he looked like uh, solid flesh and blood to me. I did not distinguish him from 
a living, breathing human being at all, which means I was seeing him in his dimension, which was, I think, the first time that that's ever happened to me. And as I walked past him, I greeted him, said, good morning, sir. And he didn't respond like he didn't hear me or see me. Um, I went in the kitchen and asked my mom who the man was with Mr. Kenyon. She said, nobody's with Mr. Kenyon. His son's on the way, but he's not here yet. Okay. I must have figured I was what? 12 years old. I must have figured it was a neighbor or a friend. I went back outside the kitchen door, back over to the truck. Meanwhile, Christine walks in. She sees him, asks mom. Then Cindy walks in, she sees him and sees through him and walks into the kitchen to tell mom. And as she's doing that, Nancy walks in and leans over to her and says, did you see that man with Mr. Kenyon? I did, but he just disappeared. Wow. And that was our introduction to the paranormal world. And it happened within 10 minutes of moving to the farm. We had visited the farm a number of times as a family before we actually moved in. None of us have any recollection of seeing anything that would indicate um, spirit activity at all Welcome until home. the day we moved in, as though they were waiting in the wings. We right. owned it. And that's when it was safe to come out and play. It was a welcome um, home. Right. And then we saw him again later. Um, as my father was talking to Mr. Kenyon in the dining room and April, my baby sister was in the kitchen for the duration with my mother. And we found out when we got there that Mr. Kenyon was not packed. He was not ready to go. And my mother had to unpack boxes and use the packing material to pack all of his dishes oh, in the cupboards so that she could put our dishes away. Um, he was not even remotely ready. Meanwhile, my father says, Earl, the house is big enough. You know, we know you don't want to leave. Why don't you just stay here with us? There's plenty of rooms. You can have your own space. And he got very emotional. And he said, I can't. My son built a home for me on his property. I have to go. Um, but he stopped and, and visited with us many times before he passed away. Uh, he was one of the most lovely human beings that I have ever had the pleasure or privilege to know. So kind, so sweet and gentle and generous and a beautiful soul. So anyway, my sister Nancy, who saw the apparition disappear, also saw him reappear while the four of the five of us were in the dining room and Mr. Kenyon was being told by my father that he could just stay and live with us. And suddenly he showed back up again in the same place in the corner. And we're all looking at each other like, do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> Without saying a word, because he's standing like three feet away from two adult men who don't see him at all, but the kids all see him. And, and we're not sure that each other is seeing them, seeing him. Um, and my sister, Nancy, later uh, said that she named him Manny because he was a man mm -hmm. and she was only 10 years old. And that was as creative as she could get at the time. <laughs> so let's bounce forward 50 years. And Cody and Satori are standing in front of the fireplace and spirit is coming through that identifies himself by the name Joseph. And everybody kind of looked at each other like this, you know, everybody's read the books. Did, did Andrea write anything about a spirit named Joseph? Nobody remembered a Joseph and there was silence as there was a little exchange and then the tapping began again. And um, what he spelled out was, Nancy called me Manny. Oh, uh, that's incredible. So, uh, I mean, Andrea Perrin and the Perrin family, like I said, they are just such respected members of the paranormal community. Yeah. Yes. And it, I can't even put into words what it means to me to, uh, I got to meet Christine and of course, Andrea, and it's just, 
Uh, I mean, I don't know how. I don't think this can be topped. It was eye opening for me. Oh yeah, very much eye opening. Because I mean, you you believe in the paranormal and and yeah, but but you're not like all up in it like I am. No, but I really... will tell you that I think that this interview here kind of opened my eyes to make me want to do things, uh, investigations, meet people, do things like this because it, it's not. You always hear that the paranormal is one sided. It's scary. It's scary. It's scary. We're getting rid of these spirits, but it's not always like that. Right. And just as these books say, and just like she said, yeah. there's love, there's, there's compassion, more there's more to it. And and I really resonated with what you said, how that you miss the spirits and how that they yeah. know you, even though that the time had I love passed. That. And, and I resonate with that because I have felt that different times, not often, but. Like, you know, I've, I've had spirits follow me home from different things and, and, I've you know, and then they would, you know, or it seems like they would be gone. And I, I would, I would tell Catherine, I miss them being around and people who don't understand that, you know, they kind of look at you like, oh yeah, you won't ghost around you right, or whatever. Right. But it's, it's like, unless you've experienced it yourself, no matter what is put into words, it cannot convey how that feeling is to miss the dead you know it's just really and and then you know like for them to know you is such an honor that 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 they know who you are to know and remember and to remember 50 years later and if you think about it you know we as a living we want to be known we want to be yeah. uh, loved and and th that's all that they want too because the majority of them they were human and they're still wanting love and they're still wanting recognition and to be remembered so that. that's you know if you have a haunting in your house or maybe look at it in a different way everything's not evil yeah. everything just are like us we want attention and love <clears throat> and understanding so uh, thank you to everyone who uh, is watching and I will see you next week.